And welcome, ladies and gentlemen, to the monastery, the open bar of the internet, the world's greatest shit show, and the place where we, the good brothers and sisters of this most holy of temples, seek enlightenment through the drunkest, craziest, and most batshit ways possible. I am your one and only gaming monk, better known as Mildra, and with me, I have a returning good brother to the temple, the man, be the man behind... Tribulation of Ash and Ruin, which we which we covered about which we covered on this te in this temple about a year ago, and the man who should not be called crazy, but he is Todd Frazee, also known as Hello. the Stray Goat himself. How you doing today, man? Another glorious day in the core. <laughs> oh, I can take I can take that so many different ways. I've, I've be my guest. I've never served, but I've ha but I have I've had people in the show who have, and some of them have told me their fa their fair share of st their fair share of stories, good good and bad about their times. Um, usually invol usually involving other people's stupidity. No doubt. Uh, and I'd be lying if I said I didn't have at least one horror story about Fort Polk. Fort Polk. All right, kick us off with a horror story of Fort Polk. Uh, it's a lot. A lot of them, like a, a lot of them, I can't. Uh, there's some that I can't tell because I don't want to get kicked off of YouTube. But the gist of it is, Fort Polk is not to some to a lot of people not well liked. <laughs> I mean, it's never in, heard of it myself. It's in the wood. It's in the middle of Louisiana. Humid ass Louisiana. Yeah. Oh, uh, I do remember get. I do remember one story being relayed to me about something about um somebody who, um, had had to do had to deal with had to deal with a officer who was very insistent that pe that people wear berets a certain way, and he absolutely hated it. Ashen police. Uh, drill sergeant. Yeah, I've heard. I'm reminded of one of the unwritten rules of no co no combat ready unit ever passed inspection, and no inspection ready unit ever passed combat. That's a good one. <laughs> but it's been it's been about a year since I ha since I had you since I had you on when it, when all that I had was just the quick start material for. Um, tribulation. Um, yes, it's been a long year. In that in that time, obviously, there's been some uh, there's been some updates. Um, did in that time, did you end up in playtesting or the like? Did you have any situation where there was some there was some combination that you did that you didn't account for being um, being uh, being a bit being a bit more busted than you thought than you thought. Oh, plenty. More busted and a lot less busted than I'd hope. <laughs> but that's what playtesting is all about. Mm -hmm. Turns out it is a heavy endeavor to create an entire system from scratch. And that leaves a lot of room for, oh, I just I made the rules for this whole set of alchemy, this whole school of alchemy six months ago, and nobody's playtested it up till now. And just now realizing... This is broken as hell with this new rule that combos over here. You, you'll know how it goes. It's uh, it's been a lot of back and forth like that. Mm -hmm. And was that was alchemy a repeat offender when it came when it came to when it came when it came to dealing with dealing with things that were that were creating issues? Alchemy was. More often underpowered than overpowered, in that I made I wanted to make sure there were a lot of restrictions as far as not anybody could just pick up an alchemy kit and use it. And getting that smoothed out took some work. And there are six different schools of alchemy, and each one play it's, their play style needed to be distinct for me to merit its existence. So that caused some problems in just flow of play. 
that needed to get ironed out. A defender for overpower tended to be on the combat side of things. So there are four disciplines in Tribulation, and each one is more or less where your character would fit in capability amongst their peers. Mm -hmm. In the combat profession, you'll have many paths you can take from skirmisher, ruffian, warrior, and then specialize in different ways. And those are meant to be broad strokes, but each one seem to o overperform in combat, which to a degree, that's what it should. Another school that's almost the exact opposite of that would be the diplomacy school, which excels in more of the survival elements of play when it comes to functioning inside a city, inside a town, or pulling resources together, hiring agents. They would, they're almost game breakers to a degree. And trying to balance them scenario to scenario from, are you traveling through the wilderness? Are you stuck in a wasteland? Are you in the middle of a battle? How are, how are you going to perform? Is there going to be a way for the character or the player to have fun with their different designs? And are there versatility options there? Uh, so those two have been the extremes. Diplomacy tending to underperform if you uh, so, for example, if you're in the diplomacy school, that's where your traditional priest might go, or your noble, or even uh, the scoundrel upshoot. Somebody who's really good at acquiring money. In different ways. So, if you're not essentially diplomacy, if you want to be, when I designed it, I designed it as somebody who knows how the game works. So I would be able to design characters that were very effective and could take advantage of those things. But the players that I have, no offense guys, that picked diplomacy <laughs> tended to make that very difficult because they didn't have those kind of strategic mindset. They wanted more along the lines of intrigue or um, just touting around wads of cash and making things happen for them. Oh yeah, the good, the good old throw money at the problem, also known as the Steiner method of combat. Steiner method. Haven't heard that one, but yeah, it <laughs> it also uh, that brings up a point that during playtesting, I would run into an issue with a lot of different groups where the game is brutal, and I advertise it as such, mm -hmm. which means you need to. It's not. It's you definitely have an advantage on the player side of things. It's just you have to think about the decisions you make when you're building your character and make sure not to put yourself put yourself in a position where you're a diplomat who doesn't have any armor and you have um, a dagger that's really really fancy you don't go charge into the middle of a fray whereas uh, I think it's that coming from like a D20 system, you can kind of do that. The D20 systems, when you make your classes, they're all built in a way that they're going to have their very obvious niche in combat, and they'll have something to do all the time like that. So playing smart is something it's almost required repeat plays, and especially in the early days. But with playtesting, I've also been able to bring that kind of decision-making forward and make it more engaging and less burdensome at the get go so the characters know where and when they can exceed and can ch or choose what they want to be good at and move in that direction more naturally and have more options that way yeah and would you say that would you say that some of that could easily be addressed by ha by um having a tape by having a table Make make very clear either through a session zero or, in my case, a primer about what's going to be expected for that campaign. Yes, <laughs> as I tend to be a more brutal dungeon master, and when I play D twenty games, I also will have se ze session zeros where I just throw a lot at them, and whoever survives, whatever character survived, get to be the <laughs> to move on, and that sets the scene. In. Uh, in Tribulation, I have a lot of mechanics right up front that say, here you go, your character's going to die. Here's all the things you can do to make it better for 
or to prepare yourself for your character's death, including having people you might hand it down to. So the problem I do run into, though, to, your, to answer your question, is I have a hard time uh, killing my players. I end up taking it too easy on them because I'm I am testing and I want the campaign to go on. And <laughs> but that's a problem. Fa- to be fair, I've seen some people boast about how difficult and how much they and 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 um and the and the like or 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 using a TPK as a as a badge of honor. It's not. No, it's on, it's only the it's only those for for those who have a big mouth and a small dick. <laughs> for me. I, What gets me going is I want to find those moments that I remember most when I was playing earlier games. And that was the moments when shit hit the fan. Mm -hmm. When shit hit the fan and somebody loses an arm or a a character that everybody everybody loves dies. But from that, it changes the trajectory of the story in unexpected ways. And the trajectory of character development in unexpected ways. So to find that sweet spot, you need to be Brutal, but also give the story room to catch the party in, in their in their darker hours and move them forward. Yeah. Like and get a whole party captured by the enemy team, that kind of thing. The enemies defeat, like wreck them in combat. wasn't expecting that, but hey, now we have this whole story where the survivors get to try to find a way to get out of the camp. And- the the um the. The analogy that that is off that has often been presented to me when somebody makes a game um, difficult for all the wrong reasons is fantasy fucking Vietnam. <laughs> fantasy Vietnam. Huh? Oh, I don't know where that I don't know where that started, but it do, but it does it do, it does it does highlight the matter. And I think an, I think another example to be used as far as making things difficult for all the wrong reasons. Is the infamous Tomb of Horrors module? Yeah, which played through that one. Oh boy! I consider that module to be the most overrated module in D and D's history. It made a point. Well, the whole the whole reason it was made was because Gygax's playtesters felt that the game was getting too easy. Yeah, it was making a point, and it did that. But then nobody want it's a, it's not something you want to play. It's not an enjoyable experience unless you're the masochist. Oh, um, okay. And one 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 might say that one one might say don't. But you play you play Dark Souls, aren't you a masochist? No, no. I like Dark Souls is all about triumph. Yeah, persistence <laughs> was all was always the goal that Miyazaki made explicitly clear. Anybody anytime somebody asked. And given yeah. how a bunch of journalists still want there to be an easy mode, he's been asked about that a lot. But yeah, <laughs> I hope not. The it, it, I liken I liken the I liken Tomb of Horrors to the Black Page from Frank Zappa. Okay. That it a inf, an infamously difficult piece to play, especially for drummers. Because because of how frequently time signatures change in between in between measures. Mm. Oh, there's also that the fact that there's a, that that um looking looking at the sheet music from a distance it looks black. <laughs> oh okay. But I'd say the big reason the big reason why I don't why I don't have a high opinion of of character death in the in the difficulty sense when it comes to tabletop is when a character is dead then the ability for that person to contribute to the table is dead with it they're, especially so they're, with the vertical level up systems present so once you get to those levels where your characters are risking death after like level one or two mm-hmm. and the tw- d20 systems they die, you have to either bring in a character that's already leveled up for them to play. And even then, they're playing with tools they're not familiar with. Or they come in at level one like they're supposed to, and they just, they're just they completely useless. See that happen. Mm-hmm. And of course... And granted, there is there is raised dead, but who the hell has twenty thousand worth in diamonds? 
That's the first thing I remove from every D20 system. Is <laughs> That's my first house rule. So there are no resurrections. <laughs> Only because I don't like that to soften the blow of any particular encounter. People at least fear so it gets more exciting. I usually don't get rid of it outright, but I put some asterisks on it. Yeah, uh, 20,000 diamonds, that's pretty hefty a asterisk. Well, I'll usually I'll usually put in some, um I'll usually put in the whenever I've whenever I've had the option um having to having to re having to re having to revi revive and reconstitute the body is an inexact science and some and sometimes things sometimes things don't come back the way that they're supposed to. It's nice. So you might get random ass mutations, or you might get um, you might get memories that you that you never experienced. Oh, um, cool. I I take a I take a similar attitude when it comes to teleporting, because in a lot of settings that I have, I'll have it that within certain within certain areas, um. Cert certain points, kind of like jump points in a in a um, space opera, teleporting is completely safe. You can technically do it outside of those points, but you are playing Russian roulette. Yeah. The whole re the whole reason that the that those safe points are there is that this is a place where you're where you're all where every single time you do it, you're going to go from point A to point B. That's how I like to imagine Star Trek is that the, every every teleport is a uh, it's a risk. Well, it's a risk if with it's the reason why you need a trained transporter chief on, on the thing so that so that they can go so they can sp pick out exactly where you're supposed to be going in a in a um in a in a three dimensional coordinate kind of sense. And make sure it's all of you that goes, and not that you half of your uh, left leg and your spleen. You and I have both seen the fly. We know how that goes. Oh yeah. <laughs> but and it, it's, incidentally, it's the reason why I um instead of instead of teleporting in a lot of a lot of the settings that I do, I I prefer things like drop ships or drop pods. Yeah, and in a fantasy setting, you're going to play in, but that teleporting is kind of like high magic, if if you use the same term I do for high magic, meaning it's all powerful, well, very well controlled, and it would change the setting dramatically mm -hmm. just for existing. Yeah, but teleporting teleporting outside outside of those points is a gamble because you, if you're if you're lucky. You'll be able to tell. You'll be able to teleport exactly where you where you need to be with no problems. If you're unlucky, time may time may move forward or backwards between between the time that you jump. You may you may end up you may end up jumping at the wrong at the wrong altitude, too high or too low, or you could teleport right into right into a giant rock or something. Do you roll a die for that in your games? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, the even even in even in the safer spots, teleporting is treated is treated as a ritual, and a lot a lot of the ritual is to is one is one giant safety measure. Yeah. So you usually have a but you usually have a I for lack of a better term, it's a it's a ley line point that you're using since you're essentially going into the ether and going out. It's it's like it's like navigating currents. Yeah. And so you'd ha you'd have you'd you'd have a bunch of people who are who are essentially ch who are essentially charting the ri charting the river you're going it you're going in and out of. And and do and doing it within specific within specific circles that have been have been set up well in advance. So and and that's that's all to do one jump safely. Doing it le doing it um unsafe doing it unsafely, you may as you may as well be skinny dipping into a raging river. 
<laughs> yeah, won't be the first time. Uh, <laughs> but I, I think you, I think you see where I'm going with it, with that whole approach. Yep. Oh. Yeah, I like that. Some chaos and some risk, and so it doesn't get taken advantage of, and it helps. It also makes an excuse for why the world isn't formed completely around this capability. Instant the, travel was something too amazing to take advantage to not take advantage of. Yeah, the clo the closest thing the closest thing that it's that it's used is is that was as a means of reduce reducing communication times in some of the settings I have, where some of the some of the bigger cities have this apparatus set up, and it's ma it's mainly used whenever emergency messages have to be delivered between cities. Yeah, okay, that's pretty cool. No more lighting the beacon. Mm -hmm. Oh, and you, and to, because of because of how because of the fact that it's it's stable, but it's not, but it's not perfect. There's an uh, there's an unwritten rule of no of nobody um nobody messes with the te with the teleport systems. And nobody, nobody brings any, and nobody brings any 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 armies or anything like that through them. And why not? Is there a law? Are there time cops or a teleport cops? Um, like Van Dam. There, in setting, there was in setting there was an incident where some where somebody somebody tried to see if they could bring their whole army through one of these, and they and um. It ended up going very, very badly for them because they t because that that ga the gate hadn't ha hadn't handled and hadn't handled trying to teleport three hundred people at once, so it did bring them out of the other gate in pieces, <laughs> falling from the sky. Uh, okay, so overall, it was a success. For all the wrong rain reasons. down death on their enemies. That's what. That's one way. That's that's one way to. On one hand, yes. On the other hand, the person who wanted to invade just kill, just killed, just killed an entire army by their own hubris. Yeah. So after that, after that, everybody who had a gate agreed, we're not going to do that. If we, if we, if if something comes, if it comes to a situation where we need to fight each other, we'll do it on open fields, like like everybody else. Makes sense. Oh. It is it's possible that they that the person who did it may have done something wrong, but after after see after word got out of, of seeing the body parts of three hundred people raining down from the skies like that, nobody was willing to gamble make that gamble again. Yep, that makes sense. Cautionary tale for the rest that keeps them in line. Yeah. So it's a, so there didn't there doesn't need to be a a teleport police in this situation because because um everybody already knows er, already is well aware of the risks of of not using the proper procedures. Yeah, that's good. So we're house ruling a lot of stuff <laughs> or in inventing mm -hmm. interesting ideas to keep things and that and your story, I would call that some brutal elements. It's yeah. not all pretty and shiny and easy. Yeah, no. Whenever, I, whenever I've hand, I'm not, sh I'm not sure your, I'm not sure your definition of brutal, but the approach that I've that I've taken is, is um, you can you can do ev you can do just about anything, but not everything is a good idea. Yeah. Okay. Consequential. Mm -hmm. um, my co my co writer and I are big fans of risk reward systems. Yeah. So risk reward with uh, going in. I like it when players can go in and know, at least to a to some degree, what the risks and rewards are. Mm -hmm. Sometimes people will lean too much on random too much on chaos or too much on uh, luck like dice rolls without having a play as being a player without being able to say 
uh, there's a good chance I'm going to accomplish this, but there's some small chance this bad thing will happen. Is it worth the risk? Yeah. And that, that's fun. That's a, well, that's really the essence of game. Chaos has it. Chaos has its place, but chaos should not Certainly. be a fallback. Right. <laughs> um. Yeah. When chaos is a fallback, I start to call that. I call that whimsical. Mm-hmm. Like, I know. I, I know some might. Some might point out the 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 chaos inherit in in say in say wild magic or chaos magic in Warhammer, but. You know what you're signing up for if you just if yeah. you decide to be if you decide to be a wild mage, for example. Yeah, and what was that? Something like a five percent chance that you would have a weird effect. It dep- It depends on the addition, but let's go with that. I think uh, Baldur's Gate when they introduced Baldur's Gate two, they introduced a wild mage. It was at a five percent. Mm-hmm. It's it's certainly it's certainly possible. But when it, but whenever it comes to th- um, putting it, putting in, putting in that, putting in that sort of thing, it's it's definitely one of those things where a G- where a GM should make explicitly clear to pl- to players what the benefit and consequence can be. Yeah. Yes. There's not uh, nothing more salty. Then you and uh, your one you and one of your players having a miscommunication in that the player feels that like they were cheated mm-hmm. because they didn't realize the stakes in play, and that yeah, that could be really. I make a point to try to avoid that as best I can, be as mm-hmm. with the magic system in tribulation. It's a bit off the wall in that you can do essentially anything that you want. If you if you have magic in your world and you're a player that has an arcane focus, you can do whatever you want so long as you and the oracle agree that it's doable, and the oracle could decide that there's higher or lower risk, and it, and there are a lot of suggestions on how this might work. A lot of modifications. Say if your magic is evil or divine or elemental, you can play around with it to change the stakes in that way. But no matter what, anytime you channel your arcane energy there's arcane backlash so you get the you could get really jacked up potentially even if you're not careful you can get yourself killed every time you tap into the other world to bring magic forth Mm -hmm. Uh, that that being that being said I have I have been under the belief that whenever that whenever you have those sort of systems there sh- there should be a way to it to not treat it as a as a count as a countdown timer you can't do anything about. What do you mean? Um, uh, like I've seen I've seen I've I remember go I remember going through um it was one of it was one of the successors to Riddle of Steel. Which is a interesting game in in its own right, but it had it where you would get where um where every time you cast you would get you would get some degree of corruption, and eventually eventually you just wouldn't be able you just would turn that character into an NPC because he's too he's too corrupt. I see. So um, it's a limited resource then. Casting it would be a limited resource. A limit a limited res a limited resource that that is. That um, you have no way of replenishing. In that yeah. particular instance, there's there was little to no option for um, getting rid of corruption that you have. That that was where I took the issue. That was where I took the issue. Yeah, Riddle of Steel. That would be a in the Robert E. Howard worlds, uh, sword and sorcery type thing, right? Um, uh, well, they took the name from the from the Riddle of Steel from the, from the film, but right. Um, it's the actual camp. The actual campaign setting is a bit is a bit more Renaissance, especially since it was endorsed by the Renaissance Martial Arts Association at the time. Okay. There's uh, 
Renaissance era. Okay, yeah, I, I probably I would like to see that system. Sounds all right, but uh, Renaissance era. That reminded me of we were speaking of making characters from different settings. Have you read anything from the Gentleman Bastard series? I have heard about it, but I haven't had the time to dive into it. I've re I want to read those through again. They're actually quite good. Scott Lynch, Lies of Locke and Lamora is the first one. And those ones have that kind of magic system where very few people have access to magic and it is dark and dangerous. Mm -hmm. And um, it's it's rare and impotent enough that it just like in the Conan stories, I wouldn't say they're impotent, but they were they weren't constantly center stage in the world. Other elements of thing like intrigue and and might had a place in the world. They weren't just completely dominated by magic. So I, I prefer those settings quite a bit. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Have you ever and, finished that book? Yeah. And speak speaking of that. Being that being that I'm a fan of of char of character, at, of of exploring character adaptation when it comes to various games, I'd like to I'd like to do that for in a in a sense to kind of put some of the stuff of tribulation into into practice. Yeah, let's do it. Um. Now, obviously, obviously, because of the fact that there isn't a outright class system in the traditional sense, it does. It does make doing this a, a little bit tricky, but not impossible. Especially, okay. since, especially since all yeah. all roads lead all roads still lead to prowess, acuity, and resolve. Those will be the attributes that make a person mm -hmm. instead of the six that you get in Dungeons and Dragons, for example. You, it's narrowed down to these three. Yeah, and in that regard, it reminds me of Tristat. And that's the that's the only thing here that reminds me of Tristat, but I digress. Yeah, uh, yeah, I haven't, I haven't played Tristat. That's uh... um that that was used for stuff like Silver Age Sentinels and Big Eyes Small Mouth, and the the three core attributes were body, mind, and soul, and they um, cascade into into other aspects. Oh, okay. And hey, the prowess, acuity, and resolve would. Could be expressed as body, mind, and soul mm -hmm. to a large degree. Yeah. Resolve being the outlier there, it is more a character's hardiness, determination, and force of will. Mm -hmm. Whenever I th were was this was a long time ago when I was devising this triad. What made what came to mind with resolve was actually John Wick, um, and Logan Nine Fingers. These characters who had they weren't the best. Or the smartest, they didn't have. They weren't like the most muscular or physically capable, or the or the most had the biggest breadth of knowledge. But they had something special about them that just made them keep going, mm -hmm. and that had a lot of strength behind it. That had a lot of. Uh, I wanted to explore those kind of characters. Yeah. Now, the first one that the the first one that I'd like to. Go in as far as the disciplines. I'd like to first go into the um, discipline paths of um, alchemy. Now, okay. alchemy and alchemy and fantasy games has it uh, is a bit is a bit amusing because th because there's the question of whether or not it should be treated as a form of magic or not. Um, I think it ultimately depends on the setting that you're working with. Yep. Um. That was a challenge when creating it to trying to make it as applicable to the as to real history as possible while still making it a game. Mm -hmm. and when it's applicable to real history, meaning real physics, it will at least be most compatible to setting to different yeah. settings. But it's not nearly as boring as alchemy actually was, <laughs> and and uh, 
I yeah. I have fr I have friends who are far more knowledgeable about alchemy than I, than I am. It's interesting stuff, but it wasn't something you'd just bring into a battlefield. No. Oh. So I suppose I suppose the first the first one I'd like to go well, I'd like to go through each of the paths and I'd like I'd like you to give me a character in in fantasy fiction or or otherwise that would pro would that if you were to adapt them into this system would probably take that path. And, oh, interesting. I didn't know we were going to go this route. All right. Uh, I'll start with apothecary. Okay. And I will I want to preface that with when you create your character, you either choose to be dedicated to a single path mm -hmm. or you make a hybrid of your own and give it its own name. I'll give a out of step example for a hybrid, say you wanted to be a barbarian mm -hmm. kind of character. You might like a woodland warrior, you might pick savage from the survival path and warrior from the combat path. Mm -hmm. And that would be your class. That would be what you are starting out. That would be that would express where you were in the world and what your experience was up to that point. You would be missing out on the dedicated bonus which would, is what we'll be seeing here if we say, if you're an apothecary. If someone is exclusively an apothecary, uh, let's see, what would be an example? Somebody who uses poisons, panaceas, and corrosives, mm -hmm. or any combination of those. Typically, alchemists will focus on a single craft, and these crafts are derived from interconnected methods which were called schools i'm not getting to that i would say an apothecary if i were to make a character in fantasy to be apothecary um, i can't think of one off the top of my head by name if you could imagine a potion vendor in a fantasy can you think of any potion vendors this is what you would have with your apothecaries I can I can picture some, like uh, if you go to a uh, old hag's house and she has here's something for your uh, erectile dysfunction. <laughs> Use this if you want somebody to fall in love with you. That kind of person, mm -hmm. that would be your apothecary. Yeah. Yeah. Um. Oh, ne next on next on the list is corruptor, which is all about toxins yeah corruptor anybody who uses vapors poisons or venoms uh you could think more veer from the first law comes to mind first he is the master poisoner mm -hmm. or as a or his assistant day in fact a, the best served cold is the book i'm talking about there that inspired a lot of the the poisons that you'd see Mm -hmm. Maesters would be apothecaries as well. I should mention that. That's probably the easier one for Game of Thrones, the Maesters. As for Corruptors, I would all, I would put the Red Viper. He might be a... He might dabble into corruption for as much as he uses venoms on his blade. Mm -hmm. So you could think a lot of assassin characters that, mm -hmm. that put venoms on their blade would dabble in as a Corruptor as well. Yeah. Uh... Can you think of any characters like that would fit that bill? As far as far as as far as ones who would ex exclusively use it, while while I'm kind of I'm kind of stretching, I'm kind of stretching the I, the idea of of um fantasy. There's there's plenty of characters in the whole Assassins Guild kind of archetype throughout throughout different forms of fiction, um, but I don't but. I'd also be remiss if I didn't mention the um the vemen the venenum. I'm probably mispronouncing it. Um ah, venenum, huh? No, I'm the, not the um f that particular faction when it com when it comes to the um Ordo Assassinorum in 40k, which Oh, okay. They are they are spe they they hyper specialize in poisons much much like how each of the 
each of the assassin each of the assassin orders with it within the greater or ordo assassinorium in 40k um they each specialize in a certain t in a certain type of assassination um and so you would have some of them as corruptors and some of them might be something later like a ruffian who specializes in stabbing in vital areas on where uh, stealth assassin types yeah let, let me so and sorry it's officio assassinorum the the office of the office of assassins um, sometimes, usually one person will get sent. Sometimes a whole team is sent as an execution force. But you have um, Kalidus, who are sh who are shapeshifters. Okay. Very, very good shapeshifters. <laughs> um, there's Eversor, who th who are the least assassin-like because their approach is getting dropped into. Getting dropped into a hot zone and killing anything that moves. Yep, that's <laughs> crass but effective. <laughs> well, re remember, nobody can notice if nobody's left alive to notice. That's right. That's right. They are usually they are usually sent whenever the whenever the High Lords of Terra need to send a message, and prefer to do it in the most violent way possible. Um. Venenum, as I as I mentioned, are master are master poisoners. Um, Vindicare are sn are um snipers. <laughs> they're the they're the person who will who will snipe you from the from the length of two football fields away, after cal after calculating the distance to do a shot in the air, that some that somehow manages manages to arc over and kill the target. I have a class for that, <laughs> but maybe maybe it's just me. But when it comes to the occultist, which is the next one on the list, yeah, the first thing that comes to mind for me is, uh, is Doctor Jekyll. Interesting. Okay, so what makes occultists different from their cousins is one they're right in the center of the tree, so to speak, so that they don't have... They're all over the map as far as their capabilities. The way they... What makes them special narratively is that they tend to source their alchemy from things that others would restrict, such forbidden ways. Body parts, funguses that are against... Uh, that are uh, a little bit off the... Off limits, sacred things, profane things. They tempt fate in that way. Things that are more dangerous than other people are willing to use, too. That's not dissuading me from thinking of Doctor Jekyll. Yep, yep, it does fit. <laughs> uh, that's just that's just who immediately comes to mind, or and or anybody who would f who would fall into the uh, mad scientist who may be playing who may be playing with fire at the moment, but chooses to do so for the sake of their own research. It, about any. NPC villain in a HP Lovecraft story <laughs> would fit into that mm -hmm. as well. The people dabbling with Dagon. And pro and probably a few HP Lovecraft protagonists in the process. Yeah, yeah. That's right. Uh, and when it comes to when it comes to trans when it comes to transmuters, um What who immediately comes to mind for me is Kang the Mad from Jade Empire because while he while he was an expert in making things fly, he was no slouch in making things explode. <laughs> hey, that's a good one. I wouldn't have thought of that one. He usually... Yep, transmuters um, make things make material change into other material. That's their specialty. That's the school's origin, and it does have volatiles right at its center. They they can make things blow up. Mm -hmm. They're also good at corrosives, meaning they can the acids and things like that. Uh, and I I could easily some, see someone playing a bit a bit of a mad transmuter who 
they um uh, they just get they just gave up trying to put him in jail because he always finds a way to melt the bars. Yeah, yeah exactly. Easy. Mm -hmm. uh, now, when it comes to the combat paths, that one obviously that one's going to be a little bit easier to um fi to figure out. The first one of the first one in that is is um is ruffian. Yes. And I'd say I'd say and I'd say anybody who's anybody who's anybody who's played through any of the any of the early Assassin's Creed game would be right at home with the ruffian. Um certainly. I'd also say, I'd also say to a cer to a certain extent um um Garrett from the Thief games would also apply even even if he even if he isn't a master swordsman the one of the one of the common tactics you you'd be using in the Thief games is knocking someone out with a blackjack. Yeah. Yep, that's where ruffians shine. This it's broad enough that if you've made you could make a ruffian or part of a ruffian be somebody who's a barroom brawler type that could just grab a pool stick, turn it into a deadly weapon, mm -hmm. and um, hold their own. You could also turn it into someone who is quite capable a assassin. The important thing is they know how to make use of their environment in ways that others couldn't, and they know how to make use of the vulnerabilities of their targets. Yeah, They learned on the streets more often than not. Mm-hmm. Uh and when it comes to skirmisher, uh, I'd say I'd I'd say and I'd say um any anybody who had anybody who has played a a stealth action game at at least one at least once in their life is going to fit in the um skirmisher thing. I'm pretty sure somebody's brought up Robin Hood at least once to you regarding skirmishers. Yeah, skirm skirmisher would Robin Hood would be iconic for that. Now, uh, Skirmisher could have been a flat archery class, mm -hmm. but I felt like it could have been more, it could catch more in that, because I don't have a lot of paths, so I like to keep them broad, but definitive. Oh. So Skirmisher is really good at moving around, finding cover, and ignoring the cover of others, and capable at making use of that range that they can put between themselves and others. Yeah. Um, so, uh, even so people with spears that are fleet of foot could take a great advantage of a skirmisher class. Yeah. I think I th I think it's because I think it's because it's from what from what I from what I understand the skirmisher is naturally at home with hit and run tactics. Yes, hit and run, or find a nice perch. They the sniper. Fits right in there, and then to more to better define your character as say if you wanted to be fantastic sniper and not care about much else, you could take some mas martial masteries mm -hmm. to further enhance that, or even some adaptions. Yeah, yeah. The whenever I th whenever I think of the of the of the iconic ranged combatant, the first thing that comes to mind for me is the White Death. White Death. What's that? What's that? From? Um, White Death is the is the nickname of Simo Hyaha, and I'm pretty sure I I'm pretty sure I mispronounced his name. But in my defense, he's Finnish. He was an infamous sniper for for Finland during the during World War Two, and especially during the Winter War of thirty nine and forty. Oh yeah. Um. As far that's, as, yeah, that's perfect. He takes advantage of the environment, and he, um, he was he was infamous for the fact that he that um that they they would they would go to, the Soviets would go to ridiculous lengths to try and find him, and and most of them would fail, even sending whole battalions into into um forests just to find one guy. So he's got two hundred and fifty nine sniper kills total. Mm -hmm. Some high and, numbers there. 
Well, part, part of the legend with him is that he never used a scope because the glint of a scope would have given him away. Yep. Okay. Very cool. I would put him, if if I were making him in Tribulation, I would mix Skirmisher with one of the survival paths mm -hmm. because of the how he would take advantage of the environment to such a degree and uh, the no-scope situation pretty nice yeah. so I would, that would be fun to make mm -hmm. and i'd say i'd say when it comes to war you're just and just any any fight any fighter knight or, or the like com comes to mind um i'm pretty sure i'm pretty sure conan has been brought up i yeah i would make conan a ruffian mm -hmm. personally just from the books anyway maybe Arnold Schwarzenegger might have been along closer to the warrior route, but I would put, or maybe just a warrior ruffian, like a hybrid. Yeah. Um, where where would yeah. you where would you put um, out when I think maybe I'm, maybe I'm misreading it, but the the appro the approach that I see with warrior is more is more like is more like the trained professional fighter, right? Somebody who has had some sort of martial training such that they've come blow to blow either in rank or in skirmish against you know, toe to toe with a foe mm -hmm. weapons in hand. So in, in that regard, it's any, any, not any knight character or, or, or it's equivalent, whether it be, whether it be samurai or shot or shot or something else would probably you name knights like... and samurai. Yeah. I would say definitely that I would probably also give them, dignitary so they'd be dignitary warriors which because they would have class and rank mm -hmm. and they would have the resources of a dignitary as well um, yeah. i'd be curious how you'd ha how you'd handle someone like miyamoto musashi because if there's one trap that off that often happens it's how to in a lot of game design it's how to handle dual wielding yeah it's contentious because it's mostly bullshit it's a it's a trope of fantasy so if you're trying to go for historical realism, it's very difficult to find the merit in dual wielding. Yeah, you see, I... it, you see it historically. It's it's used only in situations where people can't use a shield. Yeah, or whenever whenever it comes to the shield question, um, I because I I would all I would bring I would especially in games that like to claim that they can run any kind of fantasy. Mm -hmm. I would often I would often bring up the the um, samurai archetype because, well, shields weren't really a thing in Japan. The closest the closest I can find is one style, in, um, Okinawa, <laughs> and that and that really wasn't surprising. really a shield. That wasn't really a shield. It was more like a, it was more like a buckler because it was just a modified um turtle shell. And a and a very short spear. When I say short, I mean the thing is barely longer than than a forearm. Okay, well, they used shields, but you're talking peasant infantry class, and they mm -hmm. very strange shields. They mostly mounted behind them. But if some the the um, the reason I bring that up is I've I've often heard that certain ubiquitous RP fantasy RPGs can run any kind of fantasy but mm. if somebody if somebody wants to play into the the fantasy of playing a samurai class how are, how are you going to what how are you going to have them be some version of fighter when the common way to equip a fighter is a sword and board i.e. how are you going to do sword and board in a culture where shields are not as prevalent right um, you have to figure out how to balance that so that it doesn't feel like they're just chopping an arm off by not using a shield. Yeah, the the ad, the attitude the attitude that I that I've had cuz I've I've had my arguments when it comes to the when it comes to the realism thing which mm -hmm. certainly has its place, but my attitude is I prefer believability over realism. That's that's yes. that's been that's, that's a cool been, way to put it. And I know some people might say that it's the same because if something's more realistic, it's more believable. Not always. The dif the difference is in 
um portraying it portraying it in such a way that the audience is will it an audience is willing to be taken along for the ride because as an audience they want to be tricked into it <laughs> it's I have a good example for that i think mm -hmm. the uh new movies came out on netflix called all quiet on the western front have you seen it not yet it's fantastic so far but it's also tedious because it's realistic in that it's like war is hell nobody matters good luck mm -hmm. and compare that to say one of my favorite movies uh, my one of my favorite movies but world war ii movie for sure uh, is fury where it's war is hell but in there there are characters that matter and there's a form of heroism trials and tribulations that be overcome and some of it's a bit larger than life so that's what i would compare it to yeah. because like you said you want people want to be taken along for the ride because war is actually hell violence is actually hell and that's what we're we're simulating this we need to <laughs> to loosen that up a little bit to make it an enjoyable game um i think i think it's very telling that a lot of the people who de who demand realism as if as if it's the um pin as if it's this pinnacle um, never wrote a story. <laughs> yeah, fair point. Is which might might be a bit might be a bit harsh, but it's a way to say that the expertise that somebody might have in say in say military history in that case can blind you to the bigger picture. Yeah. Um. Like. Yeah, but that's true. Technically, technically speaking, it's very unlikely that. That you can be invisible to you could be invisible to a T Rex by not moving, but makes a damn good story. It may, one makes a damn good story, and two, you're able to buy it because it because it is because every because everything around that is internally consistent. That's the word internally consistent. Mm -hmm. uh, I remember get, I remember seeing Man of Steel years ago and getting kind of annoyed when. Um, there, when you have you make ex, you make it explicitly clear that the other, that ev, that the other Kryptonians Zod's followers couldn't couldn't hand had to ha, had to have yellow sunlight filtered through the suits, and then you have Zod just take just take his suit off with no problems whatsoever, and that annoyed the hell out of me. Yeah, that kind of stuff is rampant in modern Marvel, and uh... I have. I have completely no. disowned modern Marvel. <laughs> not missing it. Not missing it. Nope, I'm not I'm not missing much. Plus um I know that I know that at best I can just I can just use whatever they make as fodder for the reconstruction series on on the um Geek Watch podcast on Sundays and do a better job. <laughs> well, is that where you rewrite the stories? Um the I, the idea with reconstructions is take is take it take what's present, break things down to to their base elements and tweak a little few tweak a few things here and there at the foundation, and then rebuild it based on ba and see where see where that rebuilding goes. That's that's a good exercise. I like that. Uh, we did we did that once with uh, the one the one there's two. There's two Marvel examples that we've done that we've done this experiment with. One of them was Captain Marvel, where we where we kind of rebuilt it on the premise of being the being the en being the entry point for a fa for a Phase Four that would be built around Secret Invasion. Okay, yeah, it's kind of um, what it was in the background, and u using that to using that to establish a a um, new status quo of sorts. Oh. And instead, instead of doing instead of doing that whole thing of the ch of the chip is meant to keep her in control, no the the chip is me it was the chip or rather the restriction system for for Carol Danvers in that situation was more to, was had more to do with the fact that her powers were stronger than she could handle. It's not. It wasn't a control chip. It was a filtration chip. If you if you follow what I mean. 
Yep. Um, and the other control the, the other, dose. I got yeah. that. The other uh, the other in the other instance, which was more recent, was tackling the was tackling the disappointing Marvel anime project from the late two thousands. Because I had I had felt that I had felt that it tried to play things a little bit too straight and not. Br and if you're bringing in a legendary studio like Madhouse, um, would it ki would it kill you to take some elements and so some tech some techniques that are used in anime and mer and merge the two? Because that's that's what it what that's what it seemed like when it was originally teased. That was right under the radar for me. I didn't even see that one. Um, you didn't you didn't miss out much, but one of the one of the big one of the big ones that we did was with the with since one of the entries was Wolverine, well you ha well you have something just gift wrapped for you with with the Japan saga with Wolverine, and and you can use and you could use that to build a story that has the, that has the appearance of Kawajiri's work, especially Ninja Scroll. That w that was the angle that we had used at the time, um, but getting getting back to things when it when it comes to when it comes to diplomacy, yeah, there's plenty of games that ha that have a that ha that try and do a social co social combat or some sort of social mechanic, and a lot right. a lot of times a lot of times it doesn't work. How do you? Ha in your experience, how do you handle diplomacy, diplomacy or so, or social maneuvering, or int or intrigue, or what have you, while still being in that brutal sword and sorcery kind of approach? The first thing I did was divide the two into their own games and try to make those games fun mm -hmm. and interconnected. So intrigue is its own intrigue. Is, and diplomacy are not mutually exclusive to one another. You could be very capable, persuasive person and not have um, a lick of diplomatic, or a, what I would say diplomacy represents would be standing in the social world, capability to maneuver cities and towns and hierarchies, cur uh, courtesy, that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Sick of fancy, if you will. And intrigue is your ability to impose your wills on others. Now, for me, intrigue is 90% situational in that there's not even going to be any dice rolled. If you if you want to be interesting and realistic at the same time, you weigh the propositions of the players as if you were the person they're proposing their ideas too and mm -hmm. only when there's a chance in your mind as that that you're undecided say say if you're in, you're role playing that as the oracle you're saying i am this person i'm being persuaded is there a chance i'd do it okay in that case that's when you start an intrigue mm -hmm. and intrigue relies primarily on it's the only thing in the game that relies on the legacy rank as far as a role goes. And your legacy rank is it's secondary to prowess and acuity and resolve. And that it's something that actually grows as your character grows. And it's like it sounds, it's your your legend, how much weight you have behind your words. Mm -hmm. Because I also find that it gets a bit cheesy when players or when characters in story are rolling intelligence or charisma dice to show how flashy they are. Almost like it's a spell they're casting on people around them. I find it more pertinent throughout history and just in stories it's more interesting when you see a person come by and they're an, an envoy of the king or they're Conan themselves. Or they're, they come in and the room bends to their will. So, playing around with that idea, whereas diplomacy, how I make I, diplomacy game terms is tends to favor what I call the sanctuary. And sanctuary is any kind of town or place where it's not 
a war torn hellscape where you have the ability to eat and sleep and socialize. So sanctuary can function in this game like base building. And you could have a group that likes to do base building where they want to invest in a town or try to take control of certain places or certain aspects uh, that a sanctuary has to offer. Or they could just, in passing, take advantage of what's there. The diplomacy paths will move in and out of that more gracefully. They'll be able to accomplish twice as much as your average grunt when they get into a town and are able to move move resources around to their will. Mm-hmm. So, given given that, and given the um, th- the potential paths, the maybe it's just me, but the adherent feels feels like this feels like this game's equivalent to the the more the more religion based um, angles, like it a monk in certain circles or a or a priest or a friar that kind of thing shaman exactly they and that's why i had to say adherent finding the names for these to where they would be at least broad enough to apply to many cultures within the settings that i of ash and ruin or within many cultures across our historical world and then secondarily many cultures that you might see in any other fictional fantasy setting Mm-hmm. So the adherent is just that they are the ones who are capable of inspiring people with boons and accomplishing those boons for themselves, developing, uh, cultivating those boons within themselves in everyday life. Now, boons are the closest thing to magic this game proposes outside of the magic system, as because boons allow players to change fate and perhaps even change elements of the story in their favor or gain significant advantage for a short time all pulling off of the psychological you could argue the psychological benefits of having a particular kind of resonance with the world around you or you could argue there is something divine about it it depends on your setting depends on what you want to say Mm -hmm. That's, that's the adherent so yeah you as far as what characters might fit that bill they're all over the place I'm watching Vikings right now, and that would definitely be Athelstan. Yeah. Uh, I suppose. I suppose on. I suppose on some level, I could throw in Solomon Kane because he technically is st- is still a religious man, to being a Puritan. Yep. If he can inspire boons with, inspire a sense of awe and wonder within himself, and um. Perhaps even in others, that would make him. A Solomon Kane would have uh, definitely a lot of warrior, definitely, cap- definitely uh, combat a... capabilities. Mm-hmm. Quite, quite a bit, of, quite a bit of warrior, but th- but still, still some degree of adherent. Um, so he would be a paladin almost, the dark sense. But yeah, so if you wanted a paladin, you would go adherent, adherent warrior. He more or le- he more or less is. I've I've arg- I've argued instead of having paladins be play the um play the knight in shining armor pa- pal- um paladins should be taking more cues from boondock saints. <laughs> yep. Yeah, that's just that, I'd say that's that fits my mindset exactly. When I'm thinking of these things, I don't like the the shining knights that are perfect at everything, and there's just there's this clearly defined good, and they're on that side. That it's, it's very subjective to me, a bit postmodern, I suppose. But uh, I think it I think it ultimately depends on the on the game. The reason why I bring up that kind of thing is more is more more a reflection of of one of, of one of the philosophies I have with my table and with my designs. I de- I resent on principle the idea of design by gospel. This idea that things that things have to be done a certain way because that's what's expected because of because of genre or something like that. Um, the exa- the example that I that I often use is this idea is this idea of if you're if you're pl- if somebody's playing a ranger, then they're expected to be good w- to be good with a bow. Yeah, 
uh, they're getting pigeonholed, I think is the term, into... and Yeah, okay, I see what you're saying. Um, I first started you... It, if it's not... The whole, we... We do it this way because we've always because we've always done it this way is a circular thing. Um, yeah. And when it comes to the idea of of paladins or just or just any just any other class or or archetype, um, I've always encouraged people to think about other ways to express it. Like with um with monks, for instance, the big the big question I always ask my players whenever they play a monk is. What sort? What sort of school? What sort of school is in your background? Because there's a, there's like th there's like fifteen hundred versions of kung fu, and that's just kung fu. Right. And if you're if you're gonna if you're gonna say that you're that you're ex that you're an expert at hand to hand combat, um, even even in modern day, not everybody not everybody in the MMA game is using is using the same mixed martial arts style. There's there are some people that are certainly using that, but there's just as many who use sambo or you or use judo or use savat. Right. And so when you're designing a game that's trying to encompass all of that information, I see, especially in the early designs that I found, they tended to go the crunchy route, which was to try to actually learn and articulate every single difference as best they could in a game sense. Um. And I took a different. I took the opposite route of that, which is to try to make everything as broad as possible, to so that whatever player knowledge they have, they can bring to the table interpretively. But the rules still work. The uh, it it ultimately depends on depends on what ge what game you're deal what game you're dealing with. But I see, but I usually I usually encourage people to think to think it over that because. If you if you stud if you studied at some sort of school or even if you're self taught, that's going to play a factor into how into how that character presents themselves. Yep. Uh, and yeah, with dig, as I understand it, with dignitary dignitary is basically meant to be the so the social ra the social rank, someone someone of social rank who's expected yep. to. Act according to their station. I would say yes, and it's very. You'll find different settings where that's very interesting. Say there are a lot of cultures that won't have the same kind of uh, reverence for king or a lord that are a little bit more uh, familial and casual with it, but they'll still have that person whose role it is to to manage things mm -hmm. and that's the dignitary i think al swearingen from deadwood makes a good example of a a dignitary you might not expect yeah and um i'd say there are there are far there are far too many characters in games like legend of the five rings to when it comes to the concept of that dignitary okay. comes um. to mind I would say I would say I would say and I would say any member of the, any member of the Bayushi family and just any any of the scorpions who aren't outright ninjas because a, because a lot of them are there's all there's a lot of diplomacy when it comes to when it comes when it comes to the when it comes to the set when it comes to the um set up or uh, with um with L5R it is a game that focuses a lot on political intrigue the scorpion clan is a par is a paradox of being loyal to the empire while at the same time relying on ver using very underhanded methods right um uh, whether it be poisoning whether it be whether it be lying whether it be playing dirty pool and there's the fact that they ha that they have a policy of always wearing a mask because 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 Bioshi their founder wore wore a mask 
during during the tournament to see who would be crowned emperor, and it's implied but never outright stated that he threw that he threw his match. Yeah, I uh, I would compare him almost to Klingons too, and that 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 kind of co that um, contradiction of being incredibly honor bound, but within their honor system is using cloaks and uh, underhanded tactics to accomplish the win, no matter what. Well, Dude, that's dignitary. I think. When it comes to when it comes to the Klingons and honor, um, I think a lot of people are lo are looking at honor in the wrong way. In the wrong way, the they're looking at it in the um, post Enlightenment approach to honor, where it was more, where it was more about a personal code of ethics. Then the Klingons see it more as get your name out there. For um, Chuck Sonnenberg, who. Is, abs who is absolutely brilliant in his coverage of Star Trek, has described it as the difference between external and internal. The, the Klingons practice a practice external honor. It's more about the, ad the adherence to the social mores and move and moving up through your, through your own individual achievements within that, within those mores. Yep. Okay. And that's how I have honor defined in the virtues chapter of tribulation too. Okay. Yeah. Whereas the in, the whole internal code that you really start to really start to see in the in the Renaissance, and e and even the internal code that you see with somebody like Worf when he's written competently, is more is more of the internal kind. Uh oh. But I, yeah. I fig I figured that's a bit of clarification because I always I always hear that whole thing that whole thing of with people saying the Klingons are honorable and yet they yet they use stealth technology and ambush tactics. Oh. Yeah, that's what I said. It's um, it's a, it's a, it is only a contradiction if you're considering honor under a particular light. Yeah, a lot of people they they conflate honor with things like chivalry and the two can intersect but not by default but i'd say i'd say who but speaking of trek i'd say who also who also applies when it comes to the the whole the whole dignitary thing is um gold ducat yeah absolutely a, vi a villain too good for his own good Gosh, oh. that that was one of the best parts about Deep Space Nine. The uh, Cardassian, the actor for Gal Dukat, and um, I'll shoot the Taylor. I've just forgot the Taylor's name. Garrick. Garrick. They just killed it. So so well done. And I I do their have stories were deep. Appar apparently, the reason why he apparently the reason why he why um Dukat lived past Waltz is because. The writers couldn't 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 bring themselves to part with it with the character because they had done such a good job with him. Yeah, which is why I say that he was too good for his own good. But if I can't use that, I'd say, I'd say, I, and, and this this could go, this could go either for dignitary or scoundrel, but Mister Morden. Not familiar with that, Mister Morden. What's that from? Uh, Babylon Five. Oh, okay. He was he was basically the public face of the sh of the shadows and tended to have a deal with the devil kind of approach, especially with how clean he c he keeps his attire and demeanor. While just that, while asking, "What do you want?" Yep, that would fit, and it'd probably be a dignitary scoundrel. Mm -hmm. Mechan uh, so on to scoundrel. Then the scoundrel is mechanically. The what you would pick if you wanted to just build anything, you're going to get additional adaptions. You can gain masteries from any discipline. Thematically, it is someone who uh, the, your criminal upshoots 
or you're driven up shoots and criminal opportunists have written as some of the examples and privileged slackers like um nobles who uh, like Giselle from the the blade itself you might be a scout they they have eschewed their nobility for a while and and went their own way but still work within skirt around the shadows of nobility and privilege in their own way and i'd say a lot of a lot of people would pro could easily look at scoundrels or like and and assume that it's mostly that it's mostly low end sort of crimes with them but i think that i think the concept of using scoundrels and the like for especially a dignitary scoundrel for more white collar crime st crime fiction is something that is that isn't all that tapped yeah that's in i don't see these this domain tapped much in role playing games in general I there think... aren't places for them to move things around well, I, th I think that's because a it's... lot a lot of people are a lot of people end up getting cold feet about the idea of using about using um social mechanics yeah because uh, social mechanics uh, like i had talked about before you divide if you consider that essentially the the domain of uh, an intrigue challenge and or talking about persuasion or persuasion challenges yes i don't i would like to see other examples of games that are using the ability to take advantage of what's to offer in towns to have better access to financial resources access to hiring agents without that becoming too crunchy and that's uh, that's essentially the d domain of diplomacy i would also recommend to players if you want to dip into diplomacy it's a fantastic uh, thing to mix into or if you're a clever player, dedicate yourself to it and just gear yourself properly and take advantage of what the less straightforward options available to you. Definitely a a discipline for clever players. Mm -hmm. And true and truth be told, um rewarding rewarding cleverness should be should be a, should be stock and trade um, <laughs> you'd remember, think right i remember i remember reading through ralph coster's book a theory of fun a book that i highly recommend to anybody who even has a passing interest in design and he talked about how gamers derive the fun from coming up with coming up with their own way to overcome an obstacle and being rewarded for it yeah uh, particularly tabletop role playing gamers yeah i would hope um he didn't specify he didn't specify what sort of games he was referring to um a lot of it could be in, because of his background one could infer video games but there but um the line but, but the line between the between design ideas that you can take from one to the other, isn't as thick as people think it is. And in fact, I'd in fact I'd argue that people who want to put a Great Wall of China style barrier between the idea between the idea of taking notes from video games don't know their history. Yeah. Oh, there's a great quote, and I forget who it's from that said, "If you want to do anything well." Uh, in a creative sense, use references outside of that domain to build it. Mm -hmm. I don't know what that... I can't remember the quote. That's nowhere close to it. But that's the essence of it. Is yeah, If you're want, if you writing a Western, don't go look at other Westerns to find out how to write a Western. Look at uh, crime novels. <laughs> well, do you find, find your inspiration elsewhere. Why do you think so many Westerns were ripping off of samurai films? <laughs> yes, exactly, and that those were the good ones. <laughs> to the point where I, th 
I think um I think Kurosaki had joked that he made more money off the royalties from Magnificent Seven than he did on Seven Samurai. <laughs> It, he got royalties from that. That's fantastic. Well, Magnificent Seven was based on was based on Seven Samurai, so yeah, yeah I didn't know that he would cool. actually. But feels like they named it differently so they could avoid that. <laughs> but it's um, cool. And of course, of course, there's of course there's also there's also the fact that keep in mind that keep in mind when it comes to Kuros when it comes to Kuros Kurosaki, he not Kurosaki Kurosawa. What am I saying? Um. He fancied himself more as an editor than a than a director, and the only reason he would di he directed things was so he had an excuse to edit. According to him, so take it with a grain of salt. But yeah, the okay. when it comes to these when it comes to the survival paths, the, I'd say the, of the of the four disciplines that would be the, that would be the trickiest to nail down to one because it's really in complement. There's se there's several that could fit all three of them in one form, and it's more of it's more of a complementary one instead of one that you would that instead of one that in a lot of cases you would build exclusively on. Right, it does does serve well to dabble, mm -hmm. but it, um, I've had several playtesters play exclusively into one role or another, and to good success. It's they are distinct in their play styles though for sure. So it's just a matter of going into them and I also should say that the survival paths particularly wildling have gone through the most changes through playtesting. Just trying to nail down to where they'd have a voice of their own. A vo both I'd imagine both a voice but also to make sure that voice doesn't step on anybody else's toes exactly they had to find their niche and they the divide between the three you have adventurer wildling and savage mm -hmm. is almost like a gradient of the adventurer we could start there i suppose the adventurer would be the one who brings civilization into the wild to take advantage or to reap what treasures the wild has mm -hmm. So iconic would be Indiana Jones. Yeah, I could I could see in, I could see Indiana Jones pretty easily. If I need to use something more contemporary, I'd bring up Nathan Drake from Uncharted. But yeah, one but one directly follows the directly follows the other. So chicken and egg in that situation. Yeah, they're yeah, and uh, mechanically, the adventurer is someone who needs to take it. It was very capable in using kits, which are big packs of tools that that do things in a particular domain. Mm -hmm. Survival kit, an alchemy kit. They they're MacGyvers, so to speak. Yeah. So they can they can do that. And they're also really good at looting. If you spend a lot of time out in the wilderness or in the ruins of the world and reaping what treasures lie, they're going to double your rewards ultimately. Mm -hmm. Just having an adventurer along. Because they know what to look for. They know what what gems are valuable, what what to do with animal hide they find, that kind of stuff. Yeah. Uh, next on the list is Savage alphabetically, but I think Wildling would be more appropriate because that would be the hybrid of take they have Civilization and complete wilderness. They're making making the wilderness into their home, so they're comfortable in the wilds, but haven't been completely enveloped in them. Mm -hmm. And that term, it's not exclusive to Game of Thrones, but the Game of Thrones wildlings are a good example of that. I would say, any, can you think of any characters who survive out on their own? Um, in the wild, uh, other than like Strider, I suppose would be a wild thing. Yeah, I can I can go with I can go with that. Um, I'd also I'd also say depending on build, the Kai Lords in the Lone Wolf game books. Um, okay. And um, that's just, so I don't know who the Kai Lords are. Um, they're. 
they are they're not too far they're not too far removed from the from the ranger arc from the ranger archetype they, but they can da they can dabble in survival they can dabble in martial mastery and even dabble into some degree to some level of um of of psychic abilities it because because of the talent design of the lone wolf books there's a lot of a lot of variety in what they can do um lone wolf started as a game book it and um, it has dipped into RPG form a couple times. One of them was the multiplayer mode, which was just Lone Wolf meets D20. And then there was the more recent take that was up until recently handled by um, Cubicle 7. But I, I've been avoiding it, but the, big, but the big one I can go with is Rambo. More specifically, <laughs> Rambo in First Blood, a.k.a. the best Rambo. Yeah. So I can see that since he is, uh, he makes the wilderness his home, and he makes weapons out of, or uh, not just weapons, but tools out of the wilderness. Mm -hmm. That's that's what the wildling is most comfortable doing. They do it in their sleep. Yeah, um, I would say I would I would also bring up just and any of the Witchers from well the Witcher. I mean, not I would say yeah. The Witcher would probably be a warrior alchemy hybrid, in my book. But uh... but a lot of a lot of the a lot of their job invol that involving mo involving dealing with monsters, night the majority of it is tracking before the before combat is even considered. Yeah. Usually with different methods for different types of monsters, which is. Sure. Why in why in the game he um Geralt would correct people when he when people would say that um iron is for humans and silver is for monsters by saying both of them are for monsters. Yep. Yeah. Okay. Because people are monsters. There's the well. There's the there's the idea that people have and Champion Analysis did a very good video on this matter that um that non-humans can be put into the category of monster. But th but their job is to deal with mo their job is to deal with monsters no matter what form they take and the and human can be one of those forms. And so Fair sometimes they sometimes they might it's not uncommon in in the in the games to be for them to be hired to t to deal with a monster only to realize that there's more to it. Uh, which I think is the reason why the Witchers are so fascinating, just a, just as an just as an overall concept, because just being good at killing monsters doesn't make someone a Witcher. Right. That's a detective story. Whenever you're reading them, uh, more more or less. In part. And the the two swords thing is is more is something more from the games than it is from the books. But if I'm being honest. Although I like although I like the books, Andrei Sapkowski is a bit of a is a bit of a dick, <laughs> especially especially towards the idea of video games as a, as a storytelling medium. He wasn't a fan of that. Um, a, f a couple of years ago, he a couple of years ago he tried to sue for he tried to sue CD Projekt Red for unpaid royalties, but their response was. You didn't get unpaid royalties. We a we asked if we asked you if you wanted to take a percentage or just or just get a lump sum now. You took a lump sum both times. Little late for buyer's remorse when you when you when we approached you twice about about whether or not you wanted to renegotiate and you said pound sand. I'm paraphrasing what was what was actually said, but that was the gist of it. Right. Understood. And it's the reason why that why that particular lawsuit didn't go anywhere. <laughs> Cause, oh, yeah. like, well, it's a good. We can't have a good creative without the map. So having a got to have something bad about their personality, right? Well, not you not make all, room for being creative. Um, it certainly it certainly depends. Um, I mean, Junji Ito creates creates some of the most screwed up hor horror stories and hit. In his manga, yet outside of it, he's a complete dork. Yeah. 
who know who knows that he is because he spends most of his time talking talking about cats. Mm. Uh, but of course the other th the other thing that came the other when it comes to Savage, one of the first things that came to mind when I w when I was going through the blurb of it is things like skin changers, Wendigos, that kind of thing. Yeah, yep. There were now in a, fi a fantasy world, there would be yeah, they would basically be attuning to not just bestial characteristics, but whatever the beasts are of that world too. Mm -hmm. So what the Savage does mechanically is they get the masteries of survival are typically along the lines of bestial elements so you can hide yourself like an animal or mm -hmm. become dominate other animals got bestial empathy ferocity become more and more like an animal lose your your human nature and gain that little bit extra you also lose your heritage as part of taking the savage as a path. It's the only path that has a drawback of losing something. And those consequences of losing your heritage is penalty during uh, intrigues. And when you're trying to influence others, you're essentially going to have a cultural penalty for the fact that you don't have a shared heritage. And you don't. if you're a savage, you've lost your heritage with everyone. Yeah. But on the plus side, you get along with animals pretty good. So there you go. That uh, think of any savage characters outside of that. Um. Well, let let's go with let's go with the classic. Let's bring let's bring Tarzan into this. Oh yeah. <laughs> um, Tarzan's definitely one. I, I'd say the berserkers of history were pretty yeah. close. Were pretty close to savage. Mm -hmm. Made it a point to try to become like animals, howling like them. Yeah. Um, I'd say, I'd say, in any sort of, any sort, any sort of, any sort of shaman who's more like a, um, cheval or or, or a rider in vo in voodoo would would could also lean into that. Yeah. Um, I will. I will admit that I'm. When it comes to, I like to I like to think I have some at some understanding with a, some understanding or some ability to not talk out of my ass when it comes to when it comes to certain mythologies. But voodoo is one of the ones I'm not all that good at. I will fr I will freely admit that, and most of the knowledge that I come from that I have comes from the style of voodoo that was that would that come that came from. Places like Haiti, and eventually came to the, and eventually came to the states, especially into the Big Easy that is Louisiana. Well, sure, all religions are iterative. Mm -hmm. So anybody who claims that they get a particular religion, you're going to have to have a timestamp with that, <laughs> and an, and a region. Uh, but well, what I there are general overarching vibes. It's, just, it's a way for me to say I know enough to know that I don't know enough. Yep. But, um. One thing. One thing that I. One thing that I. Th that I thought was a smart move that was done is even with all the dis. Even with all the disciplines and all the discipline paths, there isn't one that's solely dedicated to magic. Right. And I'm perfectly fine with that because there because there's always that tr there's always that temptation of. Games that have a have some degree degree of magic system to make one archetype that's dedicated to it. Yeah. Uh, if you start referencing stories for magic using characters, you'll find your Gandalfs and your Harry Potters, where it seems like that's exactly and only what they are. But you could. Also, you'll also have your characters who are more circumstantially magic or magic accompanying what what they already are. And if you di even if you dig under someone like Gandalf, you find he's probably closer to an adventurer or a dignitary than he is uh, just some dedicated mage. Magic is something he's 
he has and he's you know he's a master of to a degree but it's something separate from his capabilities yeah. and the it's it's separate mostly because i want to be able to make a play in a world where it doesn't have to be so magic is an optional rule it also from for me it for me at the very least it it makes it far it makes it far more easy to have to have someone who is a bit of a is a bit of a gish because that that's always been an archetype that is an interesting place to explore but a lot of games have a hard time doing it what is a gish um gish is meant to be those who are adept at some level at both combat and magic um oh, okay it is it is rooted in the ends in um when the gith yanki and gith zerai races were in, were introduced into D D. okay uh oh. I'm not sure. I'm not sure when the term "gish" came from. After came from after that, but it just kind of happened that way. And there's, I know some. There's, I think, the, I think the for a lot of people the idea is far fetched, but I think it's only far fetched if you assume that magic users would be the stereotypical wizard in the tower. Or yes. Some, or th this idea that some that somebody who ha has the ability to has the ability to use magic and is out and is out in the wilds wouldn't utilize it in um in combat scenarios right oh. it's a tough nut to crack because those were i could comfortably use tribulation to fulfill any one of those niches and to a degree, we just finished up the classes, mm -hmm. what would be equivocal to classes in a different system. And they're not super definitive. They're very uh, fluid and not quite on the mark for any character. And that's by design. Mm -hmm. So I want the rules to serve the character you're trying to make, not dictate it. So you find out what elements of that character speak speak to you what you what the what ones will you can build upon and better define yourself so you start with the vague and it leaves interpreted narrative interpretation for the players to fill in the blanks and that's where that creativity comes in the important part is that the rules are sound and work with one another well and aren't broken while still being able to accomplish a wide array of cultures and time frames and and realms so even that's uh where the real fun and character creation goes so it's probably going to be i'll have to do this another time the another el big elements are afflictions and adaptions which are mm -hmm. stuff that steps outside of the realm of your trained discipline and into which the hardships your character has faced that have left scars and have forced you to change how you interact with the world. That's what an adaption would be. And that's that can shape a, a personality in very interesting ways as well. I wouldn't be able to define a character from many of the fantasies with just the paths alone. I would want to throw in some other elements of their character that are that are deeper, their natures, their virtues as well. You know what I mean? And I do want I do want to thank you for putting up with this little grandiose ex grandiose experiment of mine because oh absolutely it's been fun mm -hmm. and anytime you see fit to return whether it's to go further into tribulation or um or explore other avenues I'd like to I'd love to have you on to go over the se go over the setting of tribulation in detail down the road be great um, ash and ruin. Mm -hmm. The door, the door is always open. As I often say around here, drinking is not mandatory, but it is encouraged. Right. That's good talking to you, man. Mm -hmm. And, of course, a sincere thanks goes out to everyone who took the time out of their schedule to come onto the show and enjoy the madness. 
and there will be plenty more where that came from, as there always is here, on the open bar of the internet. But until then, on behalf of the good brothers present and not present, my name is Mildra, I am your gaming monk, stay fucking frosty everybody! <laughs>